Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. In today's video, I have turned the Pharma Drama Studio into a proper teaching room. Why? Because I want to talk about amorphous and crystalline materials. In particular, why it is you can take crystalline material, which is a solid, heat it up and it turns into a liquid, and we say the material has melted. But if you do the same thing with an amorphous material, which is a solid, you heat it up, it turns to a liquid, it doesn't melt. Why do two things that look as though they've done the same thing actually do something completely different? That's the question I want to look at. And to answer that, I need this diagram on the whiteboard behind me. So, if you're ready to understand why crystalline materials melt and amorphous materials don't, get yourself a drink. I, of course. Mm have a cup of coffee and let's make a start. This diagram you might have seen before, especially if you've watched one of my other videos on amorphous or crystalline materials, and it shows you the change in energy or volume on the y-axis as a function of temperature on the x-axis for amorphous, shown in red, and crystalline, shown in blue, materials. If you go and look in the literature, sometimes this discussion is based on free energy, which adds a layer of complexity for me because it includes entropy, and I prefer to discuss the changes in amorphous and crystalline materials just in terms of enthalpy, okay, or energy that we've um, added to the system. So that's what I'm going to do. If you want to look into this in more detail and you want to go and look at free energy discussions, by all means, be my guest. Uh, but I'm going to keep it simple for the purposes of this discussion. So the question we're addressing here is, why is it that you can take a crystalline material, which is a solid, you heat it up in temperature to above its melting temperature, and it transitions to a liquid, and we say the material has melted. But if we do the same thing for an amorphous material, which starts as a solid, and we heat it up, and it looks as though it transitions to a liquid, it's not melted. Why is it that we say a crystalline material has melted and an amorphous material hasn't? And moreover, if an amor amorphous material hasn't melted, what has it done? <laughs> That's really the sort of questions we want to get um, through today. So to do that, we need a diagram and we're gonna use this diagram here. So I'm gonna start simple with the crystalline material. So before we look at the diagram, remember what a crystalline material is. You've got lots and lots of molecules that are in principle the same molecules, let's not get into co-crystals, and those molecules are arranged in a repeating pattern, all really closely spaced together in a crystal lattice. And we can define where those molecules are in that lattice with a unit cell. There is a video I made on crystalline materials, which I'll put a link for in the description below if you want to watch that. But for now, just remember that in a crystalline material, all the molecules are packed together really tightly in a repeating structure. And those molecules are held in place with intermolecular bonds, which are very strong. And the strength of that bonding is what we call the crystal lattice enthalpy. Okay? So, if we start with our diagram down here on the left-hand side, at a temperature below its melting point, our crystalline material is a solid, shown up here in blue. As we start to increase the temperature, Increasing temperature means we're applying energy to our system. So therefore, if we go up in temperature, we're also going up in energy of the material because we're supplying energy. And at the same time, molecules are always moving. Even in a crystal lattice where the molecules are held tightly together, the individual molecules can vibrate. And the more energy we apply, the greater the vibration. And that has the effect of expanding the crystal lattice slightly. So we also see an increase in volume as we increase the temperature of a crystalline material. So far, so good. The melting point is defined as the amount of energy which we've applied to the material which can overcome the bonds holding the molecules together in the crystalline lattice. So if we hold a crystalline material even a few degrees below its melting temperature, it's never going to melt. It's never going to melt because 
You haven't given the system enough energy to break these bonds that are holding the molecules together in the crystal lattice. But as soon as we get to the melting temperature, and ideally go slightly beyond it, we have given our material sufficient energy that these bonds can break. So our material takes that energy in, it uses that energy to break bonds, the molecules become free and can move around, and the system becomes a liquid. So we see this increase in energy content because the material has taken that energy in to break bonds, and our material has become a liquid. And as we increase the temperature, we see an increase in energy or volume again because the molecules are moving around more. And these two lines have different gradients and that reflects the different heat capacities of the solid and liquid phases. Right, that's essentially how a crystalline material is going to behave. You could say to me, okay Simon, can we go backwards and forwards along this line? And the answer is, in principle, we absolutely can do that. So we can heat the material up, we can go from a solid through the melting point to become a liquid, or we can start as a liquid, we can cool down. When we get to the melting point, although admittedly in reverse, it's like a condensation point or crystallization point, the molecules should condense and form a crystalline lattice. So we see a drop in energy or volume. And then as we carry on cooling down, the system loses energy or volume. So in principle, we can go backwards and forwards along this line. Now, as I may have said before, several times in fact, when you have a system which all the molecules are completely ordered and you want to go to a liquid system, you are going from order to disorder. So when we're turning something from an order structure to a disorder structure, it can happen very fast. And the reason is because in an order structure, the position of every molecule really matters. But in a disordered system, it doesn't matter where the molecules are, it can be completely randomly dispersed. So it's very easy to go from ordered to disordered. So going in this direction, it really doesn't matter how fast we heat the material, we'll always see it melt at this temperature. Now, if you don't believe me, and you happen to have a differential scanning calorimeter lying around, take a crystalline sample, put it up in the DSC, heat it up at say 10 degrees per minute and see what the melting temperature is on your DSC. Then put the same sample in and heat it at say 100 degrees a minute and see what the melting temperature is. You'll see they're the same. So we say that uh, melting is a thermodynamic transition because the only thing that matters is it's got enough energy to melt. And it doesn't matter how fast or slowly we apply that energy, it will always melt at the same temperature. Now cooling, on the other hand, is a different kettle of fish, as we say in English <laughs> for some reason. The reason is because now we are going from a liquid state, where the molecules are disordered, remember, to an ordered state where all the molecules have to arrange in a repeating crystalline pattern. That is very different because now the molecule will have to go from something where it doesn't matter where they are to something where it matters very much where the molecules are. So every single molecule that condenses onto a crystalline solid has to do so in exactly the right orientation. And I think you might imagine that takes time. Imagine you are building a house. It matters where every brick goes as you're building it. And you can't just build a house instantly, can you? You've got to build it over the course of weeks because it takes so long to make sure each brick is in the right place. And the same is true for crystallization. It takes time for the molecules to arrange from a random disordered structure in liquids to an ordered structure in a crystalline solid. So, very importantly, if we are cooling our material down and we want it to crystallise at this point, we need to cool it really, really slowly. I think if you know anyone that works in the farm industry that crystallises materials, they will tell you <laughs> crystallisation is very tricky to control in the first place. And you've got to be really careful with conditions and time. It can take days or even weeks from materials to crystallise um, fully because it takes so long for the molecules to arrange themselves. So going in this direction, we can go as fast as we like. Going in this direction, we can't go as fast as we like. We need to go pretty slowly 
and we need to go slowly enough that the molecules have time to condense to this crystalline solid. That leads to the next question, which is, what happens if we don't go slowly enough, Simon? And the answer is, and I've got to be fair, I'm really glad you asked that question because it'd be a difficult video to record otherwise. The answer is, as we cool down too fast and we get to this melting point, because we're cooling down quite fast, the molecules don't have time to come together and form a crystal structure. So if they're in a liquid state and they haven't had a time to crystallize, what do they do? They remain as a liquid. <laughs> That's right, they remain as a liquid. And so if we were to follow the change in energy or volume of our material at this point, we would see that um, we would carry on down this red line here. Okay, and the reason we're not going down here is because the molecules haven't got time to crystallize. So because they can't crystallize, they have to remain as a liquid and they will carry on going down this red line here. When that happens, we say the material is a super cooled liquid. The reason for that is because it's still a liquid, so we, we have to call it a liquid. But it's not a true liquid. It's a liquid which is existing below the temperature of the melting point of one of its crystalline forms. So another way of looking at that is to say, well, really the material wants to be a crystalline solid. And the only reason it's not a crystalline solid is because we haven't given the molecules time to crystallize. They want to, but we haven't given them time. And so this is an in inherently unstable type of liquid. And so we need to give it a slightly different name just so that we remember it's not a true thermodynamic liquid. So we call it a supercooled liquid, and that is telling us that the structure of the material is a liquid, but it's an unstable one and it really wants to crystallize, but it, we, it can't because we're not giving it enough time. Now, those of you that are paying a lot of attention here might say to me, well, hang on a minute, Simon. What happens if we keep cooling down? Won't our liquid carry on down this line here? Dot, 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 dot. And if it were to do that, wouldn't there become a point where the volume or energy content of our supercooled liquid would become lower than the energy or volume of our crystalline material? And I would say that's a very good point. <laughs> we don't want that, do we? Because this graph here shows that the crystalline material, which has got the molecules perfectly packed, remember, should be the lowest energy or volume that our material can occupy. Therefore, there should be no way that a random collection of our molecules can orient themselves to have a smaller energy or volume than our perfectly packed crystalline material. So, this is essentially a paradox. Paradox because we, we look as though we're going to do something which can't happen for real. So that was first noticed by a man called um, Kautzmann. And so this paradox has his name, a Kautzmann paradox. And the temperature at which these two lines would cross is called the Kautzmann temperature, or Tk. Okay? Something needs to happen between here and here to make sure that this paradox doesn't actually occur. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't allow the laws of physics to be broken in my laboratory. The paperwork is an absolute nightmare. Well, I've got to be fair, it would make a pretty good paper, wouldn't it, if the laws of physics were broken. Anyway, something has to happen along here to make sure this doesn't happen. So what actually happens is um, a super cool liquid does not carry on down this line forever. There is a discontinuity in this line and the system changes direction like this. And the beauty of that is because of this change in direction, the red super cool liquid line never crosses the blue crystalline line and hence the laws of physics are not broken. Hurrah, so that's excellent. This discontinuity is very important. It's called the glass transition temperature, and it's the point at which the amorphous material forms a glass. I have also recorded a couple of videos about the glass transition, which I'll link to in the description below, if you want to go and look at those. The temperature is the glass transition temperature recorded um, Tg. So when you hear that, I made an amorphous material and its Tg is 75 degrees centigrade. That's what it means. It means at 75 degrees centigrade, 
on cooling the material formed a glass. What is a glass? I hear you ask, and the answer is, a glass is a high viscosity liquid. So even things like a pane of glass, sometimes when I'm outside, I wear glasses for instance, okay? Glasses are solid, aren't they? This is not a liquid, this material, but I can see through it. So glasses tend to be transparent, but solid materials. If you think about a pane of glass, you know, a window frame, if you look at that from the perspective of being a liquid, it's just a high viscosity liquid. So over time, like hundreds and hundreds of years, all of the atoms in the glass will actually start to sink towards the bottom of the glass. And the pane becomes thicker at the bottom than it does at the top. Interesting. So if you go to an old house and you look through the windows, um, sometimes you'll see the glass is thicker at the bottom than at the top. So that's because a glass is just a high viscosity liquid. Now, what does that mean from the point of view of this diagram? Um, and why does the viscosity change in the first place? The answer to those questions is that, remember at all points, the material is a liquid. If it's um, cooled down very fast, so a super cooled liquid, that means the molecules are randomly oriented, just like they are in a true um, liquid. But as we cool down, the system is losing energy or volume. So as it's losing energy, the molecules are moving around at a slower rate. And as it's losing volume, we have the same number of molecules, remember, we've got the same number of molecules in an ever decreasing volume. And that will have the consequence of meaning molecules are going to bounce off each other more frequently. So if we think about what happens to the viscosity of our liquid, as we cool it down, the viscosity is going to get higher and higher as the temperature of our material gets lower and lower. The way I like to think of a glass transition point then is the viscosity of our supercooled liquid is getting higher and higher and higher. At this temperature, the viscosity becomes so high that the material appears to be a solid. Remember, what you think of as a solid, it'd be something where if you apply the force to it, it doesn't deform. <laughs> it, might, it might move away from you, but the material itself doesn't deform. So a solid is where the viscosity is so high, as we apply a force to that material, we don't actually cause the material to deform. So if we were to look at our material at this temperature, we would actually see the glass as being a solid. So in the laboratory, I've often used indomethacin as an example of a tremendous glass former. If you heat up indomethacin on a watch glass, it's a white crystalline solid. When you go above its melting temperature, which is about 160 degrees centigrade, indomethacin melts and forms a liquid, a true liquid. For some reason, I don't actually know why, when indomethacin is a liquid, it's yellow. But because it's yellow, it's very handy as an example for this type of discussion. If we let, let indomethacin cool back down again, then it doesn't recrystallize on cooling because it's not following this line. Instead, it becomes a super cool liquid. And as you keep cooling it down, it will go through its glass transition temperature and become a solid. But importantly, it still looks like a liquid. <laughs> so it's a solid because you can pick it up. I've picked it up with tweezers, for instance, and you can see it's a solid, but at the same time it's yellow and it's um, translucent because it's a liquid. <laughs> so the way to think about materials in this region is that they are liquids, but they have the viscosity of a solid. So up here, what I have said is that for an amorphous material, above the melting point of our crystalline form, everything's a liquid, a true thermodynamic liquid. Below the melting point, if the material crystallizes to a crystalline form, then it's a solid, a crystalline solid. But if we don't allow it time to crystallize and we form a supercooled liquid, then below the melting point, the material is always a supercooled liquid. So the way to think about amorphous materials is they're always liquids, technically supercooled liquids, but they're always a liquid. But what happens to an amorphous liquid is that the viscosity is constantly changing as we cool down in temperature. And when we get the glass transition point, that's the point at which the viscosity becomes so high, the material feels like a solid. So after the TG, the material feels like a solid. 
It's a super cool liquid, but it feels like uh, to us like a solid. In this region here, which is the region above the glass transition temperature, but below the melting point, what does our material feel like? <laughs> That's a tricky question, and it very much depends on your own particular material. So I have taken a cop-out view here and written a question mark. It could feel like a liquid. It could, you could actually see it, perceive it as a liquid. It could be like, think of a rubber band. If you were to stretch a rubber band and flick it in someone's face, phew, the rubber band is very stretchy. But if I asked you, is a rubber band a solid, a liquid or a gas? I'm hoping you'd say it's a solid, right? So it is possible to have solids that are, are very flexible. So in this region, it could be a liquid, it could be a rubbery solid, it could be all sorts of things, but it definitely isn't a solid as we perceive it, pushing it away, if that makes any sense. So this transition point is the point at which your glass changes viscosity such that it's a solid-like viscosity to a more liquid-like viscosity, okay? That's the best way I can think of explaining it. I'll go into that in a bit more detail in the what is a glass transition um, video. So to answer the question which we started this video on, which is, does an amorphous material melt? And if not, why not? What you will see if you have an amorphous glass is that at low temperatures, it will look like a solid. You'll perceive it to be a solid. And as you heat it up in temperature, when you get the glass transition point, you will see the material will change form. I'm being careful with my words here. It could melt, but it could, it could turn to a liquid, not melt. It could turn to a liquid, or it could go to a rubbery solid, but you will perceive a change in what that material looks like. It's definitely a solid to something which is definitely not so solid. So you'll see a change at this point, but it doesn't melt. And the reason is because melting is defined as breaking the bonds which are holding the molecules together in a crystalline lattice. And I hope you can see there is no crystalline lattice in an amorphous material. Here, the material had a liquid-like structure. Here, the material had a liquid-like structure. The only difference as we go across this glass transition is a change in viscosity from a solid-like viscosity to a more liquid-like viscosity, okay? Now, for that reason alone, an amorphous material can't melt. Again, if you don't believe me, or the cynical sort, and you have a DSC lying around, take a glass of any material as a solid, low temperature, put it into the DSC, heat it up. If you did that on a watch glass, you visually saw your sample go from a solid to more like a liquid structure. If you do that in a DSC across the same temperature range, you will see nothing. You'll see nothing because there is no change in a step in um, energy at that point. That all you're doing is you're gradually increasing, uh, decreasing the viscosity of your material. And at this particular temperature, glass transition temperature, the viscosity is such that the, the molecules are now able to move as if they were in a true liquid. And below that, they weren't. But from a DSC perspective, that is enthalpically silent. And so you won't see an amorphous material melt in a DSC. And the reason is because it's not melting. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm hoping that kind of makes sense. It's a very common question that students ask. I've got a solid. I don't know whether it's crystalline or amorphous, but I have a solid. I heat them up. I see them turn to liquids. Therefore, it's melted. Uh, melting means breaking the bonds that are holding the molecules together in a crystalline structure. And if the material is amorphous, it was a liquid. It was a liquid at low temperatures, it's a liquid at high temperatures. The only difference between those two is the viscosity. Below the glass transition temperature, it's a high viscosity liquid, and above the glass transition temperature, it's a lower viscosity liquid, and hence you see no change in the DSC. Right, I hope that helps. Um, amorphous materials do a lot of things in a DSC, which is quite difficult to um, understand. One, as they go through their glass transition temperature, there is a step change in the DSC baseline. If you remember what I said earlier on about the slopes of these lines, 
The slopes of these lines are related to the heat capacity of the material. And in a DSC, the position of the baseline on the y-axis is related to the heat capacity of the material. So I hope you can see that there's a change in heat capacity going through this transition. And that is what causes a change in baseline in a DSC. But I'm going to come back to that in a separate video. And the other thing that amorphous materials do with time is they relax. Relaxing, like what you've done after you've finished your finals exams. It's the same deal. So amorphous materials will relax and that changes their physico-chemical properties and also changes how they behave in a DSC. But fear not, this video is long enough already. I'm not going to bore you with that today, but we are going to talk about relaxing in a separate video. So stay tuned for that. Right, I hope that kind of made sense. If you've got any questions, you can leave a question in the comments below or drop me an email. Either way, I don't mind. Otherwise, um, what do I need to ask you to do? I need you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That would be tremendous. Uh, and hit the like button because the YouTube algorithm likes it when you hit the like button and comment and all that stuff. Telling your friends. Tell your friends about the channel. That would be very helpful too. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.